Today, we're going to walk through the common parts of the Service Stack authentication model and how to control access to your services. When it comes to controlling access to your Service Stack application, there are a lot of technologies and standards that can be used to achieve a variety of different solutions. From credential-based standards like BASIC and Digest, to delegate authorization patterns like OAuth, as well as token-based access like API keys and JWT. Supporting different ways of identifying who people are and what they can do in your system is a very broad topic with a lot of different concepts. So this will be the first video in a series looking at authentication in a service stack application. We'll start with the fundamentals of the authentication model in this video to focusing on different providers and walking through the development process of building your own reusable authentication provider in future videos. A focus of the Service Stack framework is providing the functionality developers need to build the solutions for their customers without needing to build everything yourself from the ground up. Service Stack has wide ranging support for multiple authentication types and providers built on top of an extensible authentication model. This ties in with user management tools like those found in Service Stack Studio, creating a productive way of making sure you can provide your users a familiar way to authenticate while keeping the required code for access control to a minimum. Jumping into an example, let's get our bearings by generating a service stack application with example authentication already wired up and walk through what happens when a user logs into this application using a username and password. We can use the getting started page on the service stack website to start with a template that already contains an example of the configuration we need. Going to servicestack.net forward slash start, provide a name for your project and add the features auth an auth repository of RDBMS, and under RDBMS, select SQLite for your database. Next, we'll use the View SPA template for use with these features since the template already has a registration and login UI we can use for this example. We won't focus on the UI since all authentication services are service tech services, so we have a clean, well-defined API to put your own UI on top. Instead, we'll be focusing on what is going on during the requests that involve authentication itself. Once downloaded, unzip the project into a directory and open using your favorite IDE for .NET. Once open, navigate to the app host project, which will have the same name as you provided on the getting started page. Here we will see several configure c -sharp files in the root of this project. These are modular classes to configure different parts of your service stack app host. Being modular means we can mix in these different code-first configuration files independently, which is what the Getting Started page does to generate the project. The configure.auth.cs file configures the auth feature plugin, which is the starting point for our application initializing the different components needed to set up authentication. Here we can see the auth feature requires a session factory returning a new custom user session which inherits off auth user session and a series of iauth providers which are initialized with the app settings property. These implementations of the iauth provider interface is where the specific authentication process for each related provider is controlled. By default, the auth feature plugin provides service endpoints for logging in as well as assigning roles and permission to users. Other services like user registration are not a part of the auth feature plugin and must be added independently since not all auth provider workflows require the use of a user registration service, for example, OAuth providers. Before launching this template for the first time, be sure to run npm install to install the JavaScript dependencies. Running this application and looking at the UI, we can register a new user and log in using the simple form, which uses the credentials auth provider. Let's break down what is happening when we click the login button. Looking at a diagram for this login process, we have our SPA application calling the authenticate service, which is provided by default in the auth feature plugin. Looking at the different components involved in this diagram, let's define the role each of them play in this process. We have an iAuth repository, which is an interface for implementations that store and retrieve your user details defined by the user auth class or a class that inherits from it, such as app user in this example. 
The user auth session represents the information stored in the current user session, which can be referenced by a session cookie provided to the client in the response to the Authenticate Service API call. We also have the iCache client, which in the context of authentication is used to store and retrieve the session information for an authenticated user. And finally, we have the iAuth provider that uses some or all of these components to process the user authentication related requests. The call to the Authenticate service specifies the provider in the request which identifies which iAuth provider implementation is to be used to authenticate this user. In this case, it's the Credentials Auth provider. This provider then uses the registered iAuth repository to verify the credentials being passed in the request. In our case, this will be an ORM Lite auth repository that will be reading the data from the SQL Lite connection. After verifying the user's credentials, the session factory creates a new session populated with the details from the iAuth repository and saves the session using the registered iCache client. In this example, we are using the default in-memory cache client, but there are several other implementations that are built into ServiceStack, including using Redis and DynamoDB for storage. And finally, the session cookie is passed back to our single page application. Subsequent calls to services that require authentication will provide the cookie with the request, which is used to retrieve a session using the same iCache client. This session is then used to validate if the user is authenticated and has the roles and permissions required for this service. Jumping back to our example application and taking a closer look at the iAuth repository itself, let's navigate to our configure.auth repository to see exactly how this is configured. This class is registering an ORM Lite auth repository with a few specific options. It specifies two types in the generic constructor call and uses the IOC container to resolve an IDB connection factory, as well as specifying an option called use distinct role tables. Breaking this down further, the two types being specified is the structure of the two tables that will live in our database. Going to their definition, we can see that these are plain old c -sharp objects, or POCOs, that just represent the rows for each user in our system and don't have any behavior on their own. App user is an example of a custom user auth and shows how we can customize what information we can store for each of our registered users. The user auth details type represents user information from each auth provider the user has authenticated with. This info is what makes up the data in our primary user auth table, which in our example is called app user. Using the IOC container to resolve an IDB connection factory is how this iAuth repository will access the database to read and write user data. And finally, the use distinct role tables option is to tell our auth repository to save role information to a separate user auth role table rather than store them directly in the user session. Further down in the configure.auth repository file, we can see a configure method which takes an iAppHost argument. This method resolves the iAuth repository we previously registered and calls init schema. This call creates any missing tables in the database using the type information the auth repository was initialized with along with the roles table. Jumping to the configure.db file, we can see our SQLite connection string is currently using memory, which means nothing is persisted to disk. Changing this string to a file name like viewauth.sqlite means our application will create the database file when it starts up. Running our application, we can then have a look at the schema inside the SQLite file. We can do this directly in Rider using the database panel and adding the SQLite file as a data source. Looking at the table schema, we can see app user, user auth details, and user auth role. The table names match the class names provided to the ORM Lite auth repository. The app user is our custom class that inherits from the default user auth class and adds the three additional columns, profile URL, last login IP, and last login date. Back in the configure.auth repository file is an app user auth events class, which is being used in the before plugins loaded method to register an auth event with the auth feature plugin. This can be a good way to store custom information about your authenticated users that can be derived at the time of the authentication event. 
remembering that the auth feature plugin is the center point for configuration for our authentication. These auth events will fire for their specific event regardless of the auth provider used. In this case, our custom app user auth events is overriding the onauthenticated method. So whenever someone becomes authenticated, this method will run, populating the custom properties for the current user and save those details back into the database using the auth repository save user auth method. So far, we've looked at the different parts involved in configuring authentication and some of the common parts of the internal workings of the authentication model. So users can register and we can confirm who they are, but we will also want to control what services they can access. Next, we will walk through how to limit access to your services using the authenticate attribute as well as dive into how access control works along with different ways to control authorization using roles and permissions. The auth feature plugin itself registers services to enable assigning and removing roles from a user. This combined with the use of the distinct table for storing roles enables us to persist custom role names for a registered user. To assign these roles, an admin user is needed by default. Currently, our sample application doesn't have an admin user, but we can add an example by uncommenting the following line of code in configure.authrepository.cs. This will create a user with a password and the admin role. We can then use this admin user's credentials to make an API call to the assign roles endpoint, specifying a username with roles or permissions. Let's add the power role to the new user we created by the web interface. We're using Rider's built-in HTTP request scratch files to perform a request to assign the power role to our new users. This is making a post request to the assign roles endpoint, specifying the username and the role we want to assign in the body of the request after we've already authenticated with the admin user credentials. Looking in our SQLite file, we can see the rows in our roles table, showing our admin user with the admin role and our new user with the power role. So far, we aren't restricting any services to require the power role, but let's change that by navigating to our service interface project and the myservices.cs file. Currently, our hello service is public and does not require any authentication. We can limit access to this service for only authenticated users by declaring the authenticate attribute on the service class or specific service method. Rerunning our application and trying to use the hello service in the web UI without logging in and looking at the network console, we can see our service is returning a 401 unauthorized. Navigating to the sign in page and logging in with the new user and our hello service UI starts to work again as expected. Now going back to our service, let's limit the service to users with the guest role. We can do this by using the attribute required role and specifying the name of the role as the first argument. Logging in as our new user who only has the power role, we can see in the browser's network console that we are now receiving a 403 forbidden. Logging in with the admin user, the service works again, even though the admin user does not have the guest role. This is because the admin role by default is recognized as a super user role with access to all services. Think of users with the admin role as having root access to your application services and limit the use of this role in production environments where applicable. So let's add the power role to the required role attribute and rerun our application. Logging in again with the new user, our service is still returning a 403. This is because the required role attribute is checking to make sure the user trying to access the service has both the guest and the power role. If you want to enable access to users with either the guest or the power role, we will want to use the requires any role attribute instead. The same approach can be done for permission related attributes and when used for locking down specific actions by verb, granular access to endpoints can be achieved with this relatively simple model. So how do these attributes work? Well, all these attributes, including Authenticate itself, are request filter attributes. That is, they inherit from request filter async attribute to register a request filter, which are a fundamental part of the request lifecycle in the service stack framework. The request filters run after binding the request to your DTO, but before your service code gets fired. 
They use a priority order, which if we have a look inside the required role attribute, we can see the assignment of priority comes from an enum, forcing authentication to run first, followed by checking role access and then permissions. Additional custom security checks can be done by creating your own request filter attributes and enforcing any custom rules you need. Summing up, the Auth feature plugin is the central point of configuration for your authentication in your Service Stack app. It comes with a simplified authentication model that is highly customizable and extensible with pluggable support for popular databases, caching, and third-party platforms that provide OAuth functionality. We'll be covering more of these options in future videos, as well as the development process for how to write your own auth provider from scratch. Be sure to check out the Service Stack docs at docs.servicestack.net for more detailed information on Service Stack authentication and other features. That's it for this video. I hope it's been useful, and thanks for watching.